We now start with our first technical session titled Neighbor First Enhanced Focus, which is divided into two parts. Part one of the session will be chaired by, shared by Ambassador Amar Sinha, former Ambassador of India to Afghanistan. I request Ambassador Sinha to take over the proceedings, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everyone from Berlin. I'm based there. Well, we had a very, very um, interesting and informative inaugural session. Well, just to add to what Professor uh, uh, Chaturvedi said, what RIS does, uh, and he explained it very well. So besides documenting India's development partnership, analyzing it, uh, interpreting it, uh, RIS has also been engaged in looking forward in what should be the new development partnership narrative, architecture, and institutions for India. So that's one point that I thought I would make uh, right at the out front, and I'm very happy to be associated with RIS. Uh, we heard actually the authorities on development partnership. I don't know what I'll add, but just to begin this session, let me just sum up the way I see it, that some of the key points which emerge that Development partnership is a foundational pillar of Indian foreign policy. Uh, that I think was made by all the speakers. We have seen a rapid expansion and a greater degree of institutionalization uh, in this area. Uh, institutionalization, when I say not only the DPA, but also uh, bringing in professionals from outside the ministry into DPA to help us. Uh, and also involving the line specialized ministries in, in getting our projects done. Uh, so that is something that is, uh, it, it's a part of the evolution. Uh, uh, of course, one is re responding to the global expectations from a rising India, uh, which, uh, which is also underpinned in, in our own policy formulations of Sabka Saar, Sabka Vikas. Basically, the thought is that the rising tide of this huge economy should raise all boats and obviously periphery, uh, which is your own neighborhood, is the most important. And that is the focus of uh, our deliberation in this session. Uh, periphery is important not only because of the shared history, but also because we believe, and this is a belief of the foreign policy, that both security as well as development are not divisible. So unless we look after the welfare of others, uh, we will have to share their problems uh, in the long run. And that has been the guiding force. And that is why this great attention on first reestablishing the old value chains, uh, create uh, communication grids, uh, communicate road networks, uh, revive the inland water transport. So that all that has been happening in the last four years with much greater and renewed energy that you can see. Uh, uh, of course, Professor Chaturvedi gave you a very good idea of the different model or the thinking uh, that India has followed in our development partnership. And one thing which I would underline is perhaps because of our own experiences as a, a newly emergent nation, we realize that no nation develops unless it has indigenous capacity building. And that is why a large uh, a portion of our efforts uh, with our partners had been in capacity building. Uh, uh, now let me turn to Afghanistan, which I thought I'll speak later uh, after the three experts that I have uh, who have spoken. Uh, first, of course, let me invite Dr. Nihar Nayak, who is a research fellow at the uh, MP uh, Institute, IDSA. It's called the Manohar Parikar Indian Defense and Strategic Analysis Institute. Uh, and his, of course, specialization is climate change, uh, political violence, and, and his main area of attention is our immediate neighbor, which is Nepal. So may I invite uh, Dr. Naya, and we have an hour for this session. So I think if we can uh, keep ourselves to 12 minutes or 13 minutes of presentation, so then we have some session for question and answer. Uh, Dr. Naya, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Sinha, for your kind remarks. Uh, uh, my sincere thanks to uh, Ambassador B.J. Uh, Thakur Singh, Director General ICWA, for giving me an opportunity to speak uh, uh, on such an important uh, topic. And I must compliment ICWA for selecting such an important and timely theme, uh, because in the first session, as, you, as we heard from 
um, all the policy makers uh, basically they are expecting some amount of you know, basically uh, assessment or you know, basically evaluation of India's partnership for development projects in our uh, neighborhood. I hope uh, um, I'll try my best to uh, fulfill uh, their expectations. Uh, no, because you see the why I say that the theme is extremely important because of the four contemporary developments. Number one, the global order if you'll see, we have moved from a multipolar world uh, towards a basically multi-partnership world, number one. And number two, uh, both Nepal and India are going to celebrate uh, uh, 75 years of you know, basically diplomatic relations uh, in 20, uh, 2023. So because it, as uh, uh, India has been a key development partner in Nepal, so it is extremely important to evaluate India's performances in the last 75 years uh, in Nepal. Uh, and number two, uh, come back to um, back to home. Uh, the government of India is also basically uh, celebrate and commemorate 75 years of basically progressive India that is called uh, Ajadika Amrit Mahoschav. Again, how government of India is going to share its uh, development and its prosperity with its uh, neighborhood. And the fourth one is very important. Again, it's a new addition in our basically neighborhood policy or development partnership institutions, basically, that uh, that uh, government of India, particularly MEA, is trying to mainstream the uh, neighborhood first policy. In this regard, recently, basically, one interministerial coordination group was formed and they're trying to basically assess uh, India's appointments. So uh, that's why it is very uh, entirely important. I'll share one PPT for, you know, basically to be easier to understand the India-Nepal uh, cooperation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, in my presentation, I'll cover basically three uh, issues. Number one, basically a little bit conceptual. Uh, I'll go basically uh, what is partnership and what are its principles basically how to the, the partners we can be endure or long lasting and more beneficial to both the uh, countries and second i'll focus on my case study uh, nepal uh, and india as she uh, suggested and what are the key challenges that was the expectation from our policy makers in this morning and they wanted to know uh, how to evaluate uh, how how Government of India, our development partnership program is doing in our neighborhood, particularly uh, in uh, Nepal. Uh, look, I have given this as a partnership imperative. Why partnership is so important at this moment? As I said, we are living in a basically multi uh, partnership uh, world order, and uh, and it is also an interdependence also world order. Why I say interdependence world order because. Uh, given the emerging global challenges like all those like climate change or the pandemic, whether the economic crisis, energy crisis, nuclear disarmament issues, or maybe the transborder crimes, no country, how big that could be, cannot basically tackle without support and cooperation from other countries. So that's why I say the partnership is very much imperative uh, here in the global context in the, in the in the regional context also. And a second thing in the coming to that basically Nepal India context, if we'll see. The, the partnership also is mostly, as it has been discussed about, basically demand driven. I say it's basically goal driven. Uh, and the no country is 100% self sufficient. So, how big that country could be? That deficit can be addressed only by having a partnership. For example, here is the India and Nepal. Uh, Nepal is basically is a development deficit country and some make the resource deficit, except that's a hydro uh, energy. And on the other hand, as uh, uh, Ambassador Sin has said, you can't differentiate much with development and uh, to, you know, security. India is a security deficit. We can the security sensitivity country in terms of you know, Himalayan region because Himalaya has been identified as a formidable defense barrier from India's point of view since 1947 onwards. So between these two deficits, there is a common deficit between Nepal and India, that is the basically energy deficit. And this is a common goal, which both the countries has to be achieved. I believe that some extent in the last 75 years, we have neglected that sector uh, immensely. Uh, coming to the principle of the partnership, uh, obviously uh, the most important is basically the determination of to work together because because the challenges, as I said, are enormous. So determination has to both the countries has to be very uh, together uh, has to be there. So uh, the determination is the first point where the partnership has to you know uh, move forward. And the second is preferably the partners will be broad based 
when as the broad based meets it should not be only between g to g like the government to government or state to state level it should be go beyond maybe at the civil society level uh, maybe at the business level maybe like uh, promoting education human uh, capacity building all these uh, all these issues so therefore uh, basically need to basically a durable partnership and for the durable partnership needs a basically mechanism and and we need a very basically structure large morning they said uh, uh, the uh, Prabhat Kumar talked about basically trilateral cooperation or maybe multilateral cooperation for developing expanding our uh, development uh, cooperation and the third is basically the fundamental priorities as I said that the common goal the priorities it is very important uh, is between the two countries, whether the donors or the recipient or the host or the neighboring countries. So it's very important. And the approach may be different, maybe because suppose the climate change, US approach is different, Russia approach is different, Chinese approach is different, but goal is very common. And that is where the beauty of the partnership basically to bring the disagreement together and, uh, and move, move upward move ahead and the last point is basically we need willingness to setting up a mechanism and structure to basically achieve their goal why it is essential here because basically it helps to basically improve the communication because through the structure or the mechanism one can communicate and ensures follow through whatever the decision has been taken or initiatives has been taken and it can help basically advise uh, basically avoid any kind of surprises from your basically partnership country so these principles are very much essential to basically getting maximum benefit from the uh, partnership coming that india nepal uh, partnership program uh, which is very um, important here because it's a case study as you know uh, mr prabhat kumar and uh, ambassador sinha say that uh, India is a key development partner. I mean, our partnership, whatever the partnership concept or discussions going on the globally currently, I mean, government of India has initiated much before. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, whatever partnership is basically is a post Cold War debate has been going on, like like comprehensive partnership, strategic partnership, but much before government of India started, much before and back to 1947. And this is one of the oldest partnership and India in, in, in India's uh, neighborhood. And it, it is basically governed by 10 bilateral agreements, 10 ministerial level commissions, five secretary level committees, and seven joint secretary level committees. So this is a structure has been set up there. And there we have been government of India and Nepal have been working on 12 sectors. I mean, range starting from trade and uh, development uh, issues. And uh, uh, since Nepal was a basically a landlocked uh, landlocked country. So, government of India initially back to 1947 and 1950 focused most on the basically the connectivity issues. And government of India, the first airport, the first six airports in Nepal was basically constructed by government of uh, India. The first highway was constructed by government of India. So, a lot of uh, uh, emphasis was given on the uh, connectivity yeah. issues. Now, as I said, then to uh, India's first aid assistant was lost through the basically that's called India Aid Mission in 1954. And later on, as uh, uh, Professor Chaturvedi said that uh, it was changed from aid mission to basically a economic uh, um, um, Indian cooperation mission. Perhaps here is, is one factor is that because government of maybe a small country, Nepal, perhaps didn't like that you term using basically aid uh, that time, but perhaps that was the reason it was changed to basically a cooperation uh, mission. And later on, that uh, that India cooperation mission was changed from uh, to basically economic cooperation wing in our no, Kathmandu mission. But here the entire relationship partnership will see this is a basically treaty based partnership. It's not a basically you no know, like you know like there is no comprehensive word or kind of strategic partnership word has been used in the relationship. And the treaty based partnership because both Nepal and India identified China as their common enemy back to 1949 and 1950. So that was the one common point which brought them together. And later on, India basically focused more on the basically uh, basically felt that what is good for India, that's a good for uh, good for Nepal, that's a good for um, uh, India. Then we have had different phases, particularly there are four phases I have identified. One is the special relationship 1950 to 1940, uh, 1955, where government of India was basically helping Nepal to formulating its uh, defense policy, foreign policy, and economic policies. And first five-year plan was supported by government of India. And the second phase was basically mega development projects like airport, hydro project, uh, um, um, uh, like uh, um, uh, highways, all those focused was more given like universities were given, emphasis was given in that. And the major changes happened 
uh, in post 1990 onwards, where Nepal uh, basically adopted multi party democracy and government of India gave a lot of focus and emphasis on basically grassroots level developments. Where the Mr. Prabhat Kumar emphasized that in 2003, government of India developed that small development uh, uh, projects. And in since 2003, uh, so far, government of India has completed. Uh, till 2015 has completed 475 small development projects in an average in a, in a two decade time we have we have completed more than 200 uh, projects uh, in, in in nepal and the last phase is is very extremely important basically the neighborhood first policy and this is one important uh, uh, part of our no, cooperation is basically it's uh, guided by Prime Minister Modi's vision of basically Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, and the neighborhood policy is guided by that. And when Prime Minister Modi visited in 2014, he basically uh, discussed about that heat formula, basically how Nepal could be and India could support Nepal to develop basically highways, informational technology, and basically uh, transmission lines, and basically transways. And information all, all the issues should be focused more on that. And recently in uh, 2020, in 21, uh, our uh, current uh, uh, external affairs minister, Dr. S. Joy Sankar, he um, basically reiterated that uh, basically development, how to basically give the importance of the connectivity and building partnership. And he gave a very interesting concept, basically three C's, basically connectivity, commerce, and contact. And he argued that without these three things, the partnership in the neighborhood is not going to be very much uh, successful. And here there is a synchronization of basically that India's vision for sharing for its progressive and development benefits to a neighborhood. And at the same time, government of Nepal in 2017 talked about basically Samrith Nepal and Sukhi Nepal. When Prime Minister Wole visited, uh, he was he wanted to know more about basically India as the concept of Sabka Vikas and Sabka Vikas and all those you know, digital programs government of India uh, initiated. So Nepal wanted to take more benefit, uh, benefit from uh, that. Uh, and my last slide, I'll say, like talk about the challenges where this morning the policymakers wanted to know about that. Uh, despite we have a very you no know, successful cooperation, uh, there are a lot of benefits has been given to uh, Nepal uh, in this last 74 uh, years. Still, there are a lot of challenges are there, and I believe uh, since we have been uh, focusing on that, it needs to identify all the challenges. Number one, the, as I said, this is a treaty based. Uh, partnership and the 1950 treaty is under stress now. Currently under review, Nepalese people are trying to basically upgrade, upgrade. So if that is the case, then how would our partnership will move forward in future? Do we need another uh, treaty agreement? Do we need a comprehensive partnership agreement? Do we need a strategic partnership in Nepal? So that needs to be discussed about that. And the second point is basically most of the Indian projects has been basically identified as basically delayed and particularly if you'll see if there is a left government or particularly a Maoist government or a CPN UML or a communist formed government, most of the Indian projects has been delayed. It has been, it was recently witnessed uh, last two uh, last last year. So I mean, if in the 2014 and 15 review report, even the uh, official development assistance review report, India was not figured nowhere, despite government of India gave extra aid for the reconstruction and rehabilitation of you know, uh, uh, all the earth, earthquake affected uh, areas. And India was not, not even listed as a top five uh, uh, donor countries uh, um, uh, in, 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 in Nepal. It was rather UK, US, Japan, Switzerland, and China were figured strongly in that. And government of India stipulately, uh, it, because all the donors assessment are decided based on basically a disbursement in a, in a particular year time. But since government that year, government of India didn't disperse, only 33% disbursement happened. So they are, it was not figured in that. Otherwise, government of India is uh, giving a roughly, you know, in an average, basically you can say 50 to 70 million US dollar to Nepal in every year for the as a development aid. And the, the most emerging challenge to India is basically the new foreign aid regulations, which was introduced in April 2018, which basically going to affect our, no, as Mr. Kumar uh, mentioned, there are small development projects which are going on since 2003, because now it has been extended for three years. You don't know. It depends upon the government in Kathmand whether the program will be extended or not in near future. And the last, I can say that uh, that managing the public perception. How do uh, how do Nepalese they see government of India's development partner there? 
what I gathered from the media sources and talking to people and policymakers and civil society in Nepal, I said mostly they have used the phrase here I have placed before you that's called it's a unilateral move from India. India sets agenda. It's a junior part. India behaves like a junior partner to Nepal. It's a one way traffic. And India does not want to acknowledge the contributions of Nepal because they believe that government of India has to acknowledge or equal as a partnership, equal contributions of uh, uh, Nepal like in terms of like you know economic growth or like you know like remittances, like labor contribution, Nepal is migrant labor contribution to India's economic growth, then security cooperation like during the Maoist uprising when the Maoists were living in India, India didn't cooperate. So there are a lot of angst against India regarding this uh, uh, cooperation uh, partnership with uh, uh, India. So that needs to be, uh, I think, take it, uh, uh, it uh, seriously how we'll move forward because if when we are spending so much taxpayers money every year, if this kind of perception is there, then we have to seriously think how our partnership is uh, doing uh, in our immediate and very important uh, neighboring countries. So the last point I'll say that how to make this valued partnership and strengthen it uh, uh, further. One is that government of India need to focus more on the values. What is our core values? Obviously, is our soft power like the democracy, yeah, and also at the same time we have to push our soft power very politely, not in a very aggressive way, so that people should accept our uh, soft power. And also sensitivities to a small country, we have to address their sensitivity and be very, you know carefully listen to the smaller countries' sensitivities uh, and also meet the disagreement. So for the dis meeting the disagreement, we have to basically very frank and respectful and to discuss all those issues with a smaller country as partners, important partner in Nepal. So I think we have achieved a lot, smaller needs things to be done so that it will be basically 100% uh, successful. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Max. Thank you for your very comprehensive presentation uh, and some very valuable suggestions, which I'm sure NEA is taking note of. Uh, let me call on Dr. Biswajit Nag. Uh, Dr. Biswajit Nag is professor and head of economics at the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. Uh, he has worked with UNSCAP uh, and his specialization, I noticed that uh, uh, seems to be development uh, and both social development. So perhaps uh, I would ask him to focus on these areas and with his background on trade, whether trade itself can be an engine for development uh, in the context of South Asia, I think will be a very interesting uh, uh, to hear your insights on this aspect. Uh, Dr. Nag, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. and. Uh, it's 9 20 so i'll remind you at 10 minutes the 12 minutes okay 10 minutes i i don't have a slide so i i can actually run through my ideas uh i also like to thank icwf to give me the opportunity to speak uh, in this very important seminar and uh, and i was told that you know if i can speak uh, mostly on sri lanka but of course uh, south asia as you have mentioned is an important thing uh, let me start with Sri Lanka, and that could be true for other um, other neighboring countries as well. That our relationship is not just new, I and mean, it's a very old relation. It's a relationship of of, uh, of trust and partnership. Uh, and also, uh, it, we need to understand one thing that uh, uh, that development cooperation. I just want the audience to recall the last slide of what Nihar actually shared. Uh, that our development cooperation is getting into some challenges uh, and uh, we need to work on those challenges. And this is true not only for Nepal, this is true for many other countries. I have been involved in the uh, India-Africa Forum Summit for many years on behalf of IFT. We used to go there for training uh, the, uh, the officers in many African countries. And I have heard these things, people who are actually comparing India and China. Not now. I'm talking about at least 12, 13 years back. Okay, so that particular challenge is is always there. But despite that, India actually made uh, not a modest uh, effort, rather a great effort uh, in bringing up a new dimensions in the development cooperation. I think you know uh, many of the speakers have mentioned that you know India's approach was always different. 
India would like to look into the demand driven. Uh, as I was involved in capacity development programs in many African countries, I knew that uh, you know, our approach was that we were writing to them. We just wanted to understand what was ex exactly the need. And then we were reacting to the need, creating a prototype things for, for, for that particular country. So that was India's approach. Um, for example, uh, you know, I, I was in Tanzania. Um, somebody actually gave me a ticket to see a football match. It was pre, uh, you know, FIFA World Cup in South Africa. So this is a warm-up match between two African giants uh, who were actually playing. So I had an opportunity to see. When I was entering the stadium, um, it was written as a gift from the people from the Republic of uh, I mean, from from China. So I was asking uh, the officer out there that you know what is India's contribution. So India has given actually. Uh, uh, a supercomputer, which is not visible. And the same thing is actually there in, in Nepal as well. That, you know, um, because we are working on the soft issues, we are working on the people, and that's why it is not very much visible and it is not able to reach the common people. That is basically our major challenge. So what I'd like to highlight, especially for India and Sri Lanka, um, that, you know, uh, we had line of credit. We had grant assistance, and one of the the successful program, um, I think it's uh, you know it can be replicated in many other countries in a different way. Is basically a housing project in in Sri Lanka for the internally displaced people after the uh, the terrible uh, you know uh, period actually Sri Lanka experienced uh, for more than decade. Okay, so that was a very successful project. Uh, but uh, right now, what is happening, there are a lot of countries which, which are facing natural calamities. For example, in the case of Nepal, so housing project is one of the successful things which can be replicated in other countries in, in South Asia as well. Uh, apart from that, uh, India invested uh, its energy in supporting Sri Lanka in railways, uh, in water supply, livelihood. In health and education. These are uh, these are pretty, uh, you know, uh, close to India's, uh, you know, kind of a development assistance program. India works on health and education. Um, I myself have been part of many such program deliveries, as I just mentioned in, in Africa. So I have seen that, you know, how actually Indian hospitals, Indian doctors, because health is basically creating an ecosystem. Similarly, education also creates an ecosystem. It, it basically brings up the confidence. So the confidence building is very, very important. In case of Sri Lanka, another uh, important thing that you know we have recently uh, signed several agreements. Uh, there's a new age agreement uh, that's, that was long due actually uh, between India and Sri Lanka because there is a bit of trust deficit. I'm coming to that. That was from the trade aspect. I'm coming to that in a minute, but let me just speak on the recent developments, which was mostly on, uh, on technology, fisheries, uh, hydropower. Uh, these are the areas. So uh, we heard in the morning uh, that like UPI projects, which can be replicated. So uh, uh, Sri Lanka has already uh, actually has opted for the similar thing, which is Sri Lanka's evening. Uh, digital identity, SLUTI, that's the project India has actually committed. Then maritime rescue um, uh, uh, program, which is also an important thing because it's an island country. So like that, there are several projects uh, which, are, which are there. Uh, but what I'm trying to say in the rest of my presentation, that trade can also play an important role uh, in direct. Trade is not just a commercial um, venture. Most of the time, actually, we feel that trade is a commercial venture, and there is a, there are just two players, exporters and importers, um, nothing more than that. So one country will gain, other country will lose, something like that. But, uh, you know, uh, in my more than uh, two and a half decades of experience working with many developing countries, I have noted that trade has a huge, huge, uh, you know, impact on the society. For example, there are suppliers, there are customs, there are transporters, there are infrastructure development, there are storage issues. Uh, for example, suppose if I, I if I drink uh, a cup of uh, uh, tea, uh, which is in a cup, which is basically a Sri Lankan porcelain, uh, and at the same time, if I drink a Dilma tea, I always try to feel that, you know, 
the Sri Lanka is very close to me, right? So similarly, you know, that particular confidence needs to be given. Now, what happened in case of India Sri Lanka trade agreements, and possibly uh, the similar story for the other countries as well uh, in the neighborhood uh, that we were having part of SARC and then Sri Lanka is part of BIMSTEC. Um, we had our India Sri Lanka free trade agreement signed in 2000. Uh, however, what happened? Uh, we were not able to keep the tempo. So I just looked into some of the statistics and I found that uh, when we are exporting, uh, more than 60% of our goods were actually going through the India Sri Lanka FTA route. But while we were importing, it was between 10 to 15% only. Right? So this data is there with the Sri Lanka as well. So, so of course, uh, when two players are actually looking at the numbers, they are saying they'll be seeing that you know Sri Lankans are not able to gain much. Is only India's gain. Okay, so and 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 that particular uh, feeling was there in many many countries. So I think the most important part how to correct this. That's the last line of Ninger's presentation, which is basically how to improve the perception. So I have an uh, an idea which I'd like to share with you. In fact, I have already written in a book uh, just published by ICWA uh, that here. Global value chain, in the name of global value chain, we can think of regional value chain, we can think of bilateral value chain, where actually we can engage SMEs in both sides. What was happening, we always think of big projects, right? So whenever we think of big projects, we also need to understand below the big project, how many small players are involved. So global value chain, or in this case is a bilateral value chain actually uh, engage the SMEs which can actually change the perception. Let me give you an example that when Sri Lanka um, was uh, you know, uh, deci uh, uh, deciding about buying Indian auto autos, three wheelers, okay? They said, okay, fine, only the seat and the canopy, uh, the cover um, should be made in, in Sri Lanka. And over the time, some components and some parts should be made in Sri Lanka. Okay, so, so Indian investment must go there, not just exporting the product. So what happened, this will improve the capacity. So if we look at the, the kind of uh, the trade, what is happening after the India Sri Lanka free trade agreement, a lot of copper uh, wire companies uh, from South India um, went to Sri Lanka and they were making the wires because there are a certain better environment because copper scrap imports was much easier for Sri Lanka and they are making these products and bringing it back to India. Okay, similarly, it can be done for food processing, it can be done for education, it can be done for hospitals. I mean, you know, um, there are projects or there are attempted projects um, which didn't work out, but uh, in such cases, the cooperation actually played a very important role. So, I identify a few sectors where actually um, those cooperations are possible among the SMEs. We really do not require big players to come in because SMEs means actually a people-to-people -people contact. Okay, so this could be in the in case of apparel. In case of apparel, it is already there. India imports a lot of um, apparel elastic products uh, for our garments from Sri Lanka because of natural rubber available in Sri Lanka. They have had such efficiency. Um, we can also do it in rubber products. Um, we can do it in education. We can do it in, 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 in technical operations, in machineries uh, and, uh, and hospitals. So these, these are the few sectors where actually bilateral movements can be done as far as my understanding of the, of the data, uh, trade data so far. What is happening? Our exports are rising. Uh, only after 2014, it came down a little bit, but since 2016, again, it started. But the gap was widening, and that was the concern every time in the business council meeting of Sri Lanka. You have two more minutes. Yeah, I'm just uh, finishing maybe in a minute. I know, I think three minutes actually. So, uh, so coming uh, to uh, to the conclusion part. So I again, I'd like to focus that along with the development corporations, you can have two more drivers. One driver is basically people to people contacts in different ways, improve the image, and trade, the second part, can actually create that image. And trade through the MSMEs uh, actually 
should be considered as one of the major driver to improve the relationship to basically to basically harness um, what we call the kind of return on the investments on the development uh, cooperations that you know what kind of peaceful coexistence we can have so that our development journeys are seamless and we prosper together that's very important in the neighborhood togetherness is very important if the togetherness is not happening then actually the development journeys will be different i think you know we must have seen that nepal was drifted we also see the sri lanka was drifting so it's the high time that we can bring back we all the fundamentals are there all the strengths were there implementations are there so delay in the projects need to be reduced perception need to be improved people to people movement to be encouraged and lastly msmes need to be connected thank you very much thank you dr bisujit nag uh, sorry that we ran out of time uh, i understand that one 10 p.m. Uh, I, I have a problem in uh, assessing the India time right now. Uh, there's a break for lunch. But let me turn quickly to Professor Meda Besht. Uh, she, of course, has done her PhD in development and security, which is a very interesting uh, subject. But uh, even more interesting in her bio, I find that uh, she specializes on intersection of strategy and philosophy and the non-Western sources of diplomatic practice in Asia. Uh, so, besides talking about Bhutan and Pakistan, if you could kindly touch upon some of these uh, underpinnings of the thought behind India's development partnership, I think that will be very interesting. Uh, of course, we have time constraint, uh, so please be as brief, make it in bullet points, uh, and uh, then I can perhaps talk about Afghanistan if I have some time. Sure, Chair. and. Uh... Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. In fact, uh, I would say that the philosophical underpinnings of India entries uh, are, are very interesting, uh, particularly when you compare China's approach and India's approach. But I think maybe, you know, towards the Q&A session, I can perhaps look at some of these points. Uh, for now, uh, as the, uh, the paper, the title of the paper is, I'm going to focus on India's development partnerships, where specifically I would be looking at the case of uh, India-Bhutan development cooperation. Now, I thought before really getting uh, straight away into Bhutan, it would be interesting to look at what has India's approach been towards development partnerships and cooperation in general. And I think in this regard, the inaugural session was very informative because it really took a global view. And in this presentation, of course, my focus is uh, the South Asian uh, 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 view itself. Uh, so that I think, you know, uh, really helped. Uh, but I took the broader view in terms of looking at India's approach towards development cooperation in the neighborhood, um, because I thought that uh you know, it would help us uh, to put Bhutan in perspective. And uh, there is where the second aspect of uh, the argument in this presentation comes in, where I'm going to look at India-Bhutan bilateral engagement and uh, also perhaps draw insights as to uh, what does it really offer uh, in terms of development partnerships uh, of India uh, with other countries. Now, before I move into Bhutan in particular, I would say that if one really sort of steps back and looks at India's development partnerships in South Asia, uh, I would say there are three approaches. The top bottom approach primarily starts in the 1980s through the SARC. Um, this was where South Asia became a notional formal category. Uh, the region uh, was uh, in fact subject to strategic schism and political disharmony. Uh, but move forward to 1990s, when some of these uh, discourses started gaining speed. And uh, we see a building block approach here. And this was a more collaborative approach, a more project-centric cooperation, where uh, the focus was essentially on sub-regional groupings. And you also saw these new actors, especially the international financial institutions entering in. And therefore, there is, I would say, a direct consequence of the global actors at the regional level and some of the agendas that were being driven there and particularly it's very interesting in terms of how India is also collaborating with some of the international developmental agencies in terms of facilitating its development partnerships but move to 2000 late 1990s 2000 and uh, you know we move specifically to a bottom-up approach 
Here, the sub-regional groupings really anchor itself to the larger Asia vision. Asia vision. In fact, in the building block approach itself, uh, you know, there is a subtle shift from SARC to South Asia uh, growth quadrangle. And uh, particularly post-2000, we see uh, that the focus is uh, really on uh, moving uh, or having or adopting a cross-regional approach on which a discourse already existed, but uh, the Mekong-Ganga cooperation, um, uh, you know, um, um, and uh, I would say India's approach to Africa and um, Southeast Asia, uh, you know, get a further focus. Now, these were some of the developments which were happening at, I would say, the multilateral level in, in terms of the multilateral forum of SARC. But it's very interesting to look at India's diplomatic thinking as it was emerging. And I would say particularly, uh, you know, after uh, Prime Minister Gujral, I would take I would like to take him as my departure point. Not to forget the 1990s is a significant decade. A lot has been written on the inroads of China uh, into Asia in the public domain. Uh, but uh, there are a few markers which are associated with each of uh, the respective prime ministers. So Prime Minister Gujral's focus on non-reciprocity and accommodation. Prime Minister Vajpayee's emphasis on dialogue and negotiations the way he engaged with Pakistan and China. Dr. Manmohan Singh's uh, emphasis on shared prosperity and the arc of advantage, where essentially he was focusing on um, you know, meeting the security imperative. And uh, as far as uh, India, uh, India's uh, GDP is really focused at 10%, um, uh, you know, that would actually benefit South Asia as a whole. But we did see that, uh, that, uh, that there uh, was some resistance uh, to this idea, particularly in the SARC summits and therefore you know, India approach to these sub-regional groupings. And then we definitely come uh, to the theme of uh, this entire conference, uh, which was Prime Minister's uh, Neighborhood First Policy, which in fact really takes, consolidates some of these ideas forward. And what I really see is a strategic em embeddedness of uh, these ideas into a much more grander vision. So we have the Brick Bimstech Summit, uh, we have the Sagar Doctrine, Peace, Stability and Development. And in fact, um, each speeches, uh, the external affairs minister Jai Shankar has said that Indian Ocean is very much a part of India's neighborhood first policy. So we're seeing that India's neighborhood pol first policy is not just South Asia, but India in a very conscious manner is also foregrounding the idea of uh, a maritime uh, South Asia uh, to a great extent. Now, um, it's here that I would perhaps come to India-Bhutan bilateral cooperation. And if you look at the India-Bhutan case, I would say that it offers an exceptionally unique case um, and is, an ex is, is a case of, as I call it, South Asian exceptionalism. But the two factors that I would like to sort of highlight here. The first, I would say that since the 1950s, the relationship between both the countries has definitely moved from development cooperation to development partnership. And this is reflective really in the nature of cooperation around hydropower projects uh, in which uh, there is a change in funding patterns. The GDP of Bhutan has uh, almost in 2020 was USD 2.3 billion, which was six times than was two decades ago. And plus uh, there are these small development projects almost 524, I guess, uh, which are, uh, uh, as uh, the speakers were saying, high impact community development projects leading to socioeconomic transformation of Bhutan. But on the other hand, I would say, uh, once you look at the modalities of these of this development cooperation, uh, there are, of course, certain highs and lows. Uh, there is a trade deficit. 94% of uh, the debts uh, in Bhutan is related uh, to hydropower. And of course, there's rising unemployment. And I think when we're talking about development partnerships in general, um, and this is the larger point which I'm trying to make here, we need to really focus on specific issue areas because the specific issue areas then would demand us to really look at uh, it from a different angle. And um, it's here that I took the example, despite uh, all the bonhomie between India-Bhutan relations, I thought it's good to look at a specific issue area and see how can it really play out uh, in terms of bilateral relations. 
two imageries, I would say. Uh, first is, of course, you know, where energy becomes a site of development cooperation. And I'm sure that all of you must have read about it a great deal. The second is energy as a site of strategic vulnerabilities. And I think that's important because, uh, uh, you know, development diplomacy is a two uh, edged sword, you know, while it has its strengths, it also has uh, its own, uh, I would say, vulnerabilities. And I'll come back to this point later. But this is this slide is just representative of the energy transition which Bhutan has made. Uh, in case you see that uh, the transition has been fairly good. And the question which of course emerges from this is that what really then are the unique characters, you know, of this energy transition, which is considered to be, I would say, a case of South Asian exceptionalism. And the second, of course, which again one wants to perhaps look at and reflect that is that can this energy transition be sustainable in the long run? Now, when one really tries to disaggregate the data, look behind the figures, the question becomes that who's really benefiting? And, and, and there is where, you know, one needs a scalar perspective, of course, in diplomacy, in terms of looking at development cooperation, where one is really looking at the diplomatic engagement, but also really looking at the governance aspects. And uh, I think I really go with uh, the previous two speakers who try to highlight uh, this point. Um, so when one really looks at, uh, uh, you know, some of the statistics in Bhutan, uh, biomass and fossil based fuel continues to be the largest contributor. Uh, as far as energy from hydropower is concerned, 21% is consumed by energy intensive industries and around 70% of it is exported uh, to India. Interestingly, I would say in this whole story, uh, the story of transition itself becomes very important. And um, for convenience sake, in terms of identifying the larger patterns, I would say there are two broad phases of India's cooperation with Bhutan. The first is pre-2007 and the second is post-2007. The first phase was, I would, I would say, exceptionally phenomenal. Exceptionally phenomenal because three hydropower projects were commissioned and based on the success, in fact, uh, both the countries decided to uh, generate around 10,000 megawatts of power by 2020. Uh, now, um, uh, you know, as uh, we uh, move forward, it's also important to look at what was so exceptional in the first phase. And, and this, I think, I would say is a key lesson in terms of looking at the excellent development diplomacy between India and Bhutan in the first phase itself. You know, there was an integrated approach and the internal reforms in Bhutan were really synergized with the bilateral cooperation which was happening between India and Bhutan. For instance, institutions were developed and those institutions themselves, uh, you know, made the energy cooperation really sustainable. However, when one really moves on to the second phase, we see that, uh, uh, you know, Bhutan, um, uh, in, in, uh, you know, if you look at its current capacity, no, it's... Uh, uh, and I have yeah. two minutes. Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, it's I'm not, sorry, it's, it's all right. Yeah. It's not gone. Uh, it's, it's just above 2000 megawatts. Some of these projects are on hold. Some have been built, um, uh, four have been built in fact, but the others are still under construction. And of course, uh, you know, there are other issues which are um, associated with this. The, uh, as you all know, this is just a graphic representation of the glacial lake outburst floods. Bhutan has 25 glacial, out, uh, glacial lakes, uh, all of them potentially dangerous. Uh, we've just witnessed the heat wave in South Asia, and most of these dam projects are around these rivers. And I think this, you know, raises questions on whether the energy sort of transition is sustainable enough. Now, when one really looks at the broader picture, there are both positives and negatives. When one really looks at the positives, Bhutan has, of course, achieved 99% of electrification. 1% is through solar power. And India and Bhutan, in fact, are currently partnering under the International Solar Alliance to implement the Paris Climate Agreement through the deployment of uh, uh, solar energy. In 2010, hydropower constituted around 40% uh, of Bhutan's revenue. In 2020, it constitutes around 24%. So that means that Bhutan's dependence on hydropower is decreasing, which is a good news for Bhutan. And But on the other hand, we see that energy imports from India to Bhutan are increasing, particularly on issues related to petroleum, oil, and liquid natural uh, gas products. Uh, 
This is in fact 21% of the total energy consumption in Bhutan. And uh, the, these imports are in fact increasing on an annual basis. If you look at the run on the river projects, and again, there are some socioeconomic challenges. Now, you know, these are some narratives which I would like to highlight, because I would say that when you're looking at the development cooperation, it's good to look at the meso, the meta level, but also the micro perspectives when it comes to the interface between development and governance, uh, diplomacy and governance, you know, that becomes significant. Just read through some of these uh, uh, perspectives which have come from the Bhutanese themselves, and they have raised concerns regarding uh, some of these issues. Uh, you know, uh, one issue was regarding uh, the frequent repairs uh, and the technological malfunctions, particularly in the monsoon season. Glacial lakes are, of course, an area of concern and reliable and affordable energy. There is a lot of uncertainty also in Bhutan, and therefore it's really now going on uh, for a hybrid mix of uh, the energy sector. Um, Thank you. Can we uh, stop here? Because I think we are out of time for the session. Okay, uh, just can I just talk about these three, the insights? Yeah. Okay, uh, In otherwise I can just. Points. No, just give bullet points. Okay. All right. So, you know, I would say that the insights that really come in from development diplomacy is uh, that there are three factors which are important. Uh, democracy is one of them because the kind of development engagement you're having is having direct consequences for the domestic consequence uh, for the domestic constituencies, which in fact really has an impact. Um, uh, you know, on the politics of a country. And I think that's important. The second is the uh, the grand strategic design, you know, what are the what is really the political end goal and if the political end goal of development diplomacy is to cultivate, manage, develop relationships. Then I think uh, the governance sector really needs some attention. And, you know, given this, I would say when we talk about neighborhood first policy, uh, you know, as has been the past patterns, it should not really be interpreted as India's first policy, uh, India's first policy in the coming years. So with this cautious note, yes, I would really thank to, uh, thank, I would really end and uh, thank you, Chair, for the time. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that we have run out of time, but uh, quickly let me just cover Afghanistan, which is, of course, a unique case because in the last 20 years where we had intensive uh, engagement of Afghanistan and development partnership, the landscape has changed there completely, uh, which puts us uh, in, a, in a dilemma. But you know, what we did in Afghanistan really, uh, I, DG ICWA was present there when most of these big mega projects were visualized, you know, whether it was the, uh, the first time ever. And so what I'll just highlight are what are the key points that I learned from what we did in Afghanistan. And most of these projects, as I said, they were visualized and sort of uh, planned early 2003, 2005, when Vijay Thakur Singh was there. But it was the first time that electricity was brought to Kabul uh, through a transmission line from Uzbekistan. Uh, most of our projects responded to aspirational uh, aspirations of Afghan people, long pending aspirations. One of them, Salma Dam, which actually was started by the Soviets uh, in 1974, uh, got completed in 2016. Uh, first time Kabul and Kandahar are getting connected by electricity uh, transmission lines, which of course is funded by ADB, but implemented by Indian companies. Uh, then of course the iconic parliament building. All these projects, unfortunately, because of the security situation, uh, they thought first that they had long gestation period, but the security situation really delayed it. Uh, but finally we managed the persistence. So the key point there that despite the ongoing conflict happening in Afghanistan, there was such a buy-in by the local people that they, even the Taliban would not attack any of the projects. In fact, our people lived in remote areas. They were completely safe. They lived for 10 years without any attack. Some attacks were thwarted, but these were all sort of uh, planned outside, and it was more to deter India from doing anything else. And that was one of the key lessons. Some of our engineers got kidnapped. But they were promptly, uh, by intervention of the local Taliban, returned uh, unharmed rather quickly. Uh, so that was another key area that if the people concerned have a buy-in, they understand that what you're doing is good for them, uh, I think security considerations get mitigated uh, to a very large extent. 
The second big point is that our heavy investment in human capacity building uh, scholarship. It was the largest program that we ran over thousand scholarships, fully paid scholarships each year, over thousand uh, high tech students uh, which came to India. Uh, the lesson that I draw is that this is something that no matter what the situation in the country, this capacity cannot be destroyed. It can be displaced as we have seen the, after the Taliban has come, but it cannot be destroyed. It will it'll stay with the people forever. So and I think that's a big plus as far as our focus is. Uh, today, of course, Afghanistan is also uh, a different category of country because it's our South Asian neighbor uh, and the only neighbor with which we don't share a common border uh, because of a dispute. But historically for Afghans, India remains an immediate neighbor despite the partition of 47. And that is what has driven our policy. So even today, we have decided that despite the fact that we don't recognize the new political regime, that we will engage and we will continue providing humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. And we have done that very quickly. Uh, so, uh, but my overall experience has been, of course, uh, uh, that uh, our project implementation has improved a lot. But still, the financial approval processes create a barrier. And I always used to hear this joke from the Tajik president that tell me, uh, Mr. Ambassador, what is this finance uh, in India? Because that seems to be more powerful than your prime minister and the president uh, who come and announce projects or, or promise projects. But we always hear that the finance is yet to approve. So is there an authority above uh, these two authorities in India uh, which decides uh, what India would do? Uh, and of course, the role of the mission itself, uh, you know, it no project will successfully be implemented, if, especially if they are big, if the mission is hands off, uh, it cannot be run remotely from Delhi, uh, however uh, good the team is. So the mission, which is at the forefront, has to take a lot of responsibilities and the HOMs have to be personally involved. Only then you will uh, have less uh, pleasures, etc. And that is a lesson that I have learned. Uh, uh, with these two, of course, uh, Afghanistan, uh, the first bunch of mega projects we have already finished. Uh, we did we did all sorts of experiments. We learned from the Nepalese and Sri Lankan ex experience, started the SDPs, uh, but we had a very different model where, where we could, did not access the insurgent uh, prone areas. So we used the local agencies and the Ministry of Economy to implement these projects on behalf of us. Uh, and these were very successful and, and it's really it was gratifying to see that none of them got touched by anybody, any violence. There was no destruction of what we built, despite the fears here that we are investing a lot of money and it'll all go waste. Uh, but anyway, our investments in the human capital are not going to go waste and that's going to stay uh, and that would uh, keep uh, old India in good stead. So with these words, I thank all the three participants and ICWA for organizing this amazing conference. In fact, I already have an idea for the next one, that what next? Because we really have to think of new models. One thing has been established that India's development partnership experience is unique, and it's a story which needs to be told. Uh, so we'll have to look at new financing models, new institutional structure for global cooperation, because it is also clear that without alliances and partnerships will not be able to do or, or match uh, some of the narratives that were built around. Uh, so that is why we are working on something called a global development center, which basically showcases and leverages India's own development experiences and focuses on good stories from around the world uh, as, a, as a platform where it can be exchanged. Uh, because uh, in the end, it is not the lack of resources uh, which hampers uh, development. It's actually the lack of uh, uh, domestic or uh, indigenous uh, capabilities, and that is where we have uh, focused on. With these words, thank you very much, and I'll come back to ICWA with the next project uh, on development partnership. Thank you. Ambassador Sinha, uh, sorry, uh, there are some questions which has come on the private chat and WhatsApp. Can I put up just two of them? Yeah, please, why don't you? Uh, because the, the panelists are here. One question is, in I, light I of the pandemic... The I'm stopping all of you from a lunch. In the light of the pandemic, what should be the future pathway in the health sector, green energy and sustainable development in both Bhutan and Nepal? And one other question is, in what other ways India can assist Sri Lanka in the present economic crisis? Yeah. 
I'm just uh, reading the question. This is on, on Sri Lanka, right? Yeah. In what other ways India can assist Sri Lanka in the present economic crisis? See, crisis basically an uh, internal issue. So, uh, you know, it's very difficult for an other country to directly get involved. So India's involvement uh, mostly in the process of development, as just Ambassador um, explained, that even in Afghanistan, it is mostly on the development projects, capacity development, women empowerment. Okay. So we need to find out in Sri Lanka, what are such kind of issues? I mean, in the past, as I mentioned, like a housing project. Okay, so this is just after the crisis. So a lot of people, internal people are displaced. So uh, providing uh, a kind of a house is basically a basic need. And in that case, India stepped into, okay. So uh, so similar way, I mean, from the crisis, uh, the local mission will be able to tell us that these are the opportunities, these are the areas where actually India's involvement will be non-political actually that that is the word i would like to highlight so in such cases uh, we can identify the projects and we can provide development assistance as well as the rights of credit in that there's one question actually i'm seeing uh, from someone who is a chairman of a company in assam and he writes that uh, we possibility the the manufacturing in sri lanka uh, the cost was 1.5 times that of india see see the thing is that you know uh, you are a businessman, you have a company, your objective is to maximize the profit. If the prof immediate profit is one point, if the cost is 1.5 times, you will also need to identify what is the potential profit. If the profitability is more than in, in than India, of course the cost can be absorbed because you have not mentioned about the possible profit, you have mentioned about the cost. So cost is high, from a micro point of view, from an individual investment point of view, this is not a uh, worthy project. But what is about profit? If the profit is more, definitely you should go there. Uh, one thing I'd like to add on Sri Lanka, you know, because that is a clear example that India would remain perhaps uh, for the region lender of the last resort. And we would be called upon to uh, sort of uh, collect the detritus or the debris of uh, some of the irresponsible lending, etc., that has happened. But Sri Lankan situation also, and this is an idea that was given to us by the former chairman of um, uh, Exim Bank, uh, provides an opportunity for a market-based intervention. You see, Sri Lankan debt, of course, a large part of it, uh, a substantial part of it uh, is uh, owed to China. But Sri Lanka had also borrowed uh, rather indiscriminately, I would say, in retrospect, uh, from the international financial banks. And these bonds are uh, today uh, being traded at 30 or 40 percent discount in the market, but it still creates a huge financial overhang on Sri Lankan budget. So whether India can look at just providing grant assistance as bailouts to Sri Lanka to pay these banks or uh, have an instrument which can intervene in the market and buy off these bonds from the commercial banks at a discount. Uh, for future, and that would be a huge vote of trust in uh, Sri Lanka's future. Uh, so that is something which we have suggested to the government to have a look at. Yeah, I think it's a very good idea, sir. Can I answer the question on Bhutan here? Please, please go ahead. Yes. And, uh, Yes, and then we can go to Nepal, perhaps. Uh, you know, when on sustainable development, I guess a good starting point is to really look at uh, the uh, philosophical uh, framework of Bhutan itself, which is the GNH, which really offers a middle path to development. And if you look at some of, I would just sort of, you know, identify three core pillars here, which is culture, good governance and environment, where Bhutan always emphasizes a balance on these factors. So any approach towards sustainable development, given that Bhutan has excellent environmental policies, it would be nice to sink in policies with that of Bhutan's overarching uh, philosophical uh, framework. 
that is one. The second, in terms of more robust development partnerships, I think what is really needed is a good combination of market research uh, or, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know the, the perceptions which are coming uh, from the ground. And I think you know uh, this combination of market uh, uh, the, the market priorities, uh, re, uh, perspectives from the ground, and uh, policies of the government, in fact, can go a long way in terms of building robust partnerships. If I've answered both the questions or in case there's anything left. No, thank you. I thank the chair and the speakers for sharing their views. Uh, we will now take a short break for lunch and join back for the second part of the first session at 1400 hours Indian Standard Time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.